Is it just me, or every time I see Grogu slash Baby Yoda in this latest Mandalorian episode, riding in his little bassinet, I just want one of those balls on a chain to drop out so he can fully look like Dr. Robotnik in a little green elfish form. But seriously, no, the episode's good, I like it, let's dive into it. Before we dive into this review of The Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 2, which by the way was much, much better than the first, uh, it's important that we go into a little bit of Lorne Connor giving us his early impressions of what he thought this episode was going to be. I think that's a lot of fun to see what he was predicting and whether or not it came true. I also want to let you know that Lorne is quite the trooper. He actually woke up late at night reviewed the episode, did everything uh, that he was needed to do to put out this excellent content, and then at the last minute we had to scrap doing the review, uh, as at least as far as publishing it at the time that we had expected because we had that major scoop about Apple and Skydance and John Lasseter and we had to cover it. And so it went into the uh, morning slot yesterday. If you haven't checked out that video, you need to go check it out. It's a, it's a real big deal. Uh, link is in the description below, but kudos to uh, Lauren Connor for taking it like a champ. You know, it, it doesn't always work out when there's breaking news that we get to cover things exactly as we had anticipated, but uh, we, we do greatly appreciate Lauren. And so what we'll do is let's take a look at how his predictions went. I'll give you my review of the episode and then we'll go to Lauren because I know honestly he is so much more knowledgeable and has such great expertise on Star Wars as far as lore and content goes. Uh, than I could ever imagine having. And frankly, that's why many of you are here to hear what Lauren Connor has to say about it. So without further ado, let's dive in. I haven't really had very many thoughts about what episode two could entail. I haven't watched any of the pre-release leaks or videos or anything. So I know some scenes have been shown, but I kind of want to go into these things as unspoiled as I can. There may be an occasion where they might put out a teaser trailer or something like that that I might see. But in this case, I don't think I've actually seen anything. My guess is for this week's episode, we're going to launch straight into the quest to get a new memory chip for IG-11. This is not going to be one of my favorite plot lines because I think it's kind of a mistake to bring this character back. But um, I'm guessing from there, we're probably going to see the scene where Mando goes into the all droid bar is what it looks like. I, I think this is probably going to be a comedic episode. I don't know if we'll actually get IG-11 back in this episode. If we do, I imagine it'll just be at the very end. I'm sure there will be some kind of subplot that's involved. The The pirates may make a return appearance. Don't know. Uh, I wouldn't be opposed to seeing maybe a little bit more with Bo-Katan as well. I think they really need to set up that plot line. I'm hoping we don't spend a whole lot of time on side quests. Uh, I'd much rather get into the whole Mandalore plot. I think that's where the meat of this season should be. I want to see more about uh, the minds of Mandalore. I hope they get into Mandalorian history. Uh, I think the living waters are going to be very important. We've seen the armorer pouring liquid into the oil that they use for quenching. I suspect that they're going to be revealing that that's very important in their production of Beskar, maybe like uh, the use of, of uh, charcoal in the production of steel is my guess. And so those waters, if they don't have access to them, would limit the Mandalorian's ability to continue to produce Beskar. That's probably why they need to reclaim uh, whatever the Empire took. I think that's also an interesting plot point that could be explored. Beyond that, I don't really know what to expect. I'm kind of excited to see uh, whether we hit on any of these points or if I'm completely off the mark. Uh, I'll be setting an alarm for midnight so I can catch the broadcast as soon as it drops. Again, if I'm a little bleary, I apologize, but I'll do my best to put my thoughts together in some kind of a coherent fashion, and I'll talk to all of you after. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, folks, before we dive into the review portion of this video, if you like content like this, consider clicking the like button and share and subscribe if you would so choose. We covet your comments, so drop a comment down below. This is not an echo chamber. We actually care about what you think 
and we often respond. And finally, don't forget that the Pro Show is coming out March 23rd. Thursdays will be the days that you can tune into the Pro Show. That will be our first live endeavor. We look forward to having you there. You are the electricity that makes all of this happen. All right, so before we do Lauren's review, here, here's what I thought. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I liked this episode. This was a major improvement over the first episode. Um, I do worry that the first episode may have been mediocre enough that some people were tuning out and saying, well, Star Wars has lost it. You know, maybe even Favreau doesn't have it all together anymore. But in terms of, of the second episode, this was back to form. However, the form was very interesting in my opinion. And that is because I felt like this entire episode was sort of like a video game. In fact, there were many times when we were watching this that I, I thought, this is World of Warcraft. Maybe it's uh, World of Mandalorecraft. Whatever the case may be, when, when he goes into the cave and we get the first baddies who show up, you know, I just had a lot of fun with that because I thought, oh, I've done this before. I know what this is. This is the beginner cave, right? So these are the these are the kobolds. These are the trogs. They're going to show up that he's got to defeat. And then he continued on. And sure enough, a little bit later on, we get a boss. And it's, by the way, it's a really cool boss. And we get a little mini boss. Uh, I don't know what loot he drops, but uh, it's a, a spider mech looking thing that is sort of like one of those uh, Russian dolls where it, it just keeps on having more and more uh, hermit crab assemblies inside of it, right? So if you destroy one thing, another thing pops out. It's, just, it's still in there. And so that was all a lot of fun. It was, it was a cool idea. But again, you know, this felt like Elder Scrolls. This felt like World of Warcraft. Uh, this felt like questing in a video game. Another funny thing that I, I noticed was when they first land on the planet, I couldn't help but uh, chuckle a little bit because the droid, you know, it's on wheels. And so when they landed and it's in this one spot where the ground is perfectly flat and uh, no obstructions at all, I thought, well, you know, that's that's pretty fortuitous for that droid, you know, because <laughs> otherwise it's just not going to be able to get around on uh, on the planet. So I, I will say, too, some of the dialogue is uh, rough. Some of the dialogue is, is very poor, but that's because they're essentially having to go with monologues because baby Yoda Grogu is not allowed to really talk yet. And so you get some you get some pretty rough stuff when it comes to the things that the characters are saying. Another area that I thought needs some work is Bo-Katan, and that is that uh, when we first met her this season, she's in full sulk mode, and she's still sulking all right. But when Grogu arrives to her palace, let's say, it's, it's pretty empty, and I'm not sure why she wants it. And by the way, Bo-Katan, you really... Uh, should consider calling a furniture store because that that seat you're in is just not comfortable looking at all. You you could use a cushion. But uh, when Baby Yoda arrives, you know, she's ready to tell the Mandalorian that she's not going to help him if he needs help. And yet, because Baby Yoda arrives and says, apparently, that uh, the Mandalorian needs help, she goes into full girl boss mode. She goes and she defeats all the bad guys in the cave, uh, which really goes to show... Uh, to the Mandalorian that the next time you go questing and you're going into an area that's a little bit higher level than you, you need to go find some friends and take them with you. Have a party together and uh, maybe next time take a healer. If he had had a healer or maybe even a tank, there was a good chance he could have overcome the spider mini boss. Baby Yoda, pretty good mage in the back in the background there, but you know, it's just not enough. You got to get that full, uh, the full three rolls going here. Okay, we're back in, but we are dying slowly. So anyway, I liked it overall. The The quality was much better. It's a fun episode. Kids are going to enjoy it. In terms of the writing, it's rough. And uh, I'm not sure where this season is going now. Because if we already got in the water, I don't know what we're going to do. There is one final point that I think is very interesting about this. And I, I want to talk about the religious symbolism of the living waters. This is something that may escape many of you if you've not studied anything in terms of ancient history. But in terms of uh, religious symbolism, the living waters that the Mandalore must go, or the Mandalorian must go into uh, in order to seek redemption is highly correlated with the idea of baptism. And the idea of the living waters is a Judeo-Christian idea. 
it comes from the uh, ancient peoples, how they identified that there were two different types of water. Uh, there was stagnant water that was not good for you, right? And so, you know, standing ponds or water left in pots for a long period of time. But living waters are waters that are flowing and safe to drink. And so uh, that is what is used in religious imagery, uh, especially in Christianity, but also in Judaism, uh, or Judaism, I apologize, when they're talking about uh, living waters and associating that with the divine and, and perhaps rebirth using living waters. Uh, it's talking about the kind of water that sustains you and keeps you going. And so to have that imagery then brought over into the Mandalorian where uh, he ha he must be baptized essentially in the living waters uh, is, is John Favreau and perhaps Dave Filoni using some of that religious imagery and ancient symbolism. Uh, how well it works in the Mandalorian, we don't know. But I will say this, if you are ever partaking in a religious ceremony such as a baptism, always make sure that there's not a 30-story dinosaur-looking creature in those waters with you. That is not the kind of thing you want to see in a baptistry. And for the ancient Mandalorians, perhaps they could have used an exterminator. There are a lot of creepy crawly things in their destroyed city. All right, let's hand it over now to Lorne, who I'm sure will go deep, deep, deep into Star Wars lore. Lorne, take it away. Good evening, folks. I have just finished watching the second episode of The Mandalorian Season 3. Uh, this episode is titled The Minds of Mandalore. Uh, I had said in my pre-broadcast remarks that I thought that we might start off with the side quest of finding the memory chip for IG-11. Uh, the episode did start off in that direction, but all of that was taken care of before the opening title card, and that was a surprise. It was very welcome. I'm glad we kind of ditched the side quest early. Uh, we did have the Mandalorian go back to Tatooine during the Boonta Eve Festival, which is kind of fun to see. Uh, he got R5-D4 as his astromech uh, for getting down to Mandalore and sampling the atmosphere, and from there we get right into trying to find the mines. I'm not going to say a whole lot about the plot of this episode, other than that opening that I gave you that was all mostly taken care of in the first five to ten minutes of the episode. Uh, speaking of which, this episode is longer than they have typically been. I think it was about 45 minutes or so. Nice long episode. Uh, I want to start off with what I think people might bring up as the negatives in the episode first, just so that you know what you're up for. One of those is that uh, a lot of the episode is... Uh, well, I don't know if I should say a lot. Uh, the first part of the episode is fairly Grogu-centric, and I know that Grogu is starting to grate on people a little bit, I think because of both overexposure and because uh, he has not advanced himself a whole lot. We're starting to see that change in this episode. He's gurgling a lot more. He's making different vocalizations. I think we're probably getting pretty close to speech. It's also obvious that they've been working on how they're animating his movement. He's far more mobile in this episode, which was kind of fun to see. Um, for those people that are starting to not like Grogu, I would just tell you, hold on for the rest of the episode. He doesn't he doesn't completely dominate it. There's just a lot of him in the beginning. Um, one of the other things that people may complain about is that this episode is very dark. Not in the tonal sense, in the lighting of almost every scene in the episode. Most of this is because the bulk of the episode does take place on Mandalore. It's a ruined planet. There's not a lot of natural lighting, and they are underground for most of it. Uh, that means that Sometimes the action is going to be a little hard to see. I know that bothers some people. It's a complaint that a lot of people had about the Solo movie. Uh, it was not a problem for me, but it might be for you. Um, the final thing that I think people might take issue with, especially for lower purists, is that there is uh, some change in Mandalorian history, and I don't want to get too specific about that. Um, I know this is going to drive the absolute purists crazy. I understand why that would be the case. Here's the caveat I'm going to give, and, and uh, I want to be 
careful about how I phrase this because this is only the second episode of this season. And uh, I have been very um, vocal about my dislike about a lot of what Disney has done with Star Wars, particularly when it comes to needlessly changing previously established lore. But what I'm going to say about this episode, again, without getting into plot, is that this may be one of my very favorite Mandalorian episodes that's ever aired. Um, you could say that in some ways, not a lot happens in this episode. It's all taking place mostly in the same location. But what I can say is that I felt, even though it's dark, it's visually beautiful. Um, Bo-Katan plays a big part in this episode. That was welcome. Katie Sackhoff just absolutely owns this part. She did a wonderful job. There are things that I saw in this episode. S some of that I have to be nonspecific about because when I say things, I literally mean things. I don't know what they were. I don't know what they're called. Um, but I saw some of the best creature effects work, some of the best uh, animation. Uh, one of the things that I love uh, about uh, good Star Wars is that if uh, you see a movie or uh, one of these shows, if it makes you want to buy the art book, that's usually a good sign for me. Uh, it means that they, they spent some time thinking about what they wanted to put on the screen and they made it fantastic. Um, from this point on, I am going to get a little bit into spoilers because there's one specific thing I want to discuss about this episode, and it's a contrast between Bo-Katan and Din Djarin. They get a lot of time to talk in this episode, and it comes down to some of their philosophical differences about uh, the Mandalorian clans themselves and how the different factions view each other. It was interesting to get into Bo's head a little bit about that. You can tell in this episode, she still longs for a leadership position. She is still focused on power. But you also see the pain that the fracturing of Mandalorian society has caused her. Although I think she has some blind spots about her own part in what led to that fracturing. Towards the end of the episode, uh, she and Din are discussing the living waters. And this goes back to Bo's part that there's, there's nothing magical about the waters. Uh, she, she believes that uh, what the death watch clan believes is all children's stories and superstition. And I think she misses the point. I don't think that's how death watch views things. I don't think that they necessarily think there's anything magic about it either. The act of redemption for them comes to the fact that they're holding to a code that they believe in. It's about honor. It's not necessarily about anything mythical. Even so, something mythical does happen here, and I believe it's probably going to change Bo for the better. Uh, she's going to learn that there is something about children's stories that is true, and that that can be a, something that redeems the way you look at the world. And I think that is a commentary on Star Wars. That's why these stories are important to people. They are children's stories. They are told in a mythological frame. But there's truth in them about people and about how they relate to each other. And it's a place where people of differing views can come together and share some common ground. And I think that's how you begin to reunite the Mandalorian tribes. And I think the sooner that we as a community uh, can come to a place where we can, can feel that way about each other, where we can come together again, the better off that we are. Now, that doesn't mean we have to agree on everything. And there's an awful lot about Disney Star Wars that I don't agree with. But this episode this episode was good. Uh, I'm hoping that the rest of the season continues in the vein, in this vein. I'd like to see a lot more of that. Tell me what you think. I want to know what you guys thought of this episode. I was very happy with it. I, I will understand if there are, are people who are not, but for me, 
I'd probably put it in my top five at least, and maybe more. I'm going to have to think a little bit more about it. Uh, I will have a review up probably in the next day or two. I'm not sure if I'll get one out tomorrow. Um, but let me know what you think when you see this video. I'm, I'm anxious to hear your thoughts. In the meantime, take care, everybody. We'll talk to you real soon. Great thoughts from Lauren Connor. Folks, if you like content like this, click the like button, share, subscribe. And now that you've seen it, drop a comment. We'll see you next time, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Keep learning, keep growing, and keep having fun.